morning. My name is Lauren Jones. I'm a deacon here at Mercy View. And today we will be reading from uh, two passages. We'll be in Romans. Nope, we're not going to be in Romans. We're going to be in Matthew uh, chapter 16, uh, verses 13 through 19. And then we'll be in Acts 16 as well. And we'll be in verses 16 through 24 and 35 through 40. So these verses can be found in the blue Bibles underneath their chairs on page 480 and 539. If you don't have a, a Bible at home, we'd love for you to take one home. It would be a gift from us. So we'll start in Matthew 16, verse 13. Now Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi and asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they say, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And we'll go over to Acts 16. And we'll start in verse 16. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God and who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And she kept doing this for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned to her and said to the spirit, I command you, come out in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the ver that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews and disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful as us, for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And they had, in, when they had inflicted them with many blows, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, they put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. And then to 35. But when it was day, the magistrate sent to the police, saying, Let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrate, and they were afraid. And when they heard that they were Roman citizens, they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. This is the word of the Lord. Hey, good morning. Good to see you. Welcome to Mercy View. Uh, my name is Brad, one of the pastors here, and uh, if you're visiting with us today, just want to echo Trey's uh, welcome to you. Thankful that you've joined us um, today. Well, we've got a lot to get at, so um, we're going to jump right into our series today. As I've said uh, in introducing this series, it is a super light topic that we're going to tackle uh, over the next four weeks. Uh, the goal over the next four weeks is to take a look at the way that uh, the church, Christians, uh, and politics intersect. And maybe one of the questions you might have already is, do they 
really at all and in any way intersect with one another? We're going to get at that question over the next uh, few weeks. One of the things that's uh, very interesting to me about this topic is uh, the fact that me and Holly and, uh, as you know, Alan and Bryce just spent some time uh, in the UK. And uh, their political system and the way that they do politics in the UK uh, is very different than what we do. Uh, some similarities, I guess, but, but a lot of differences. Um, and in fact, really, America's founding uh, is in part because we didn't like that form of government, right? And so it is really interesting to have conversations with uh, uh, you know, British people uh, about their political system, what they like, what they don't like, and uh, in many ways it made me so thankful for, uh, at least in theory, the, the experiment, the, the idea of what uh, America has, has always meant to be. But because we are dealing with a topic that absolutely has a ton of heat around it, I need to say a few things before we jump into our passages this morning. First is this, um, our official vision statement here at Mercy View, if you don't know, is this, to equip individuals, families, and communities to be formed in the gospel to the glory of God and the good of the city. Um, that is what we are running after as a church. And our hope is and our prayer is is that in every context that you find yourself in here at Mercy View, whether it's the worship gathering like right now, uh, a gospel community, a D group, other equipping uh, settings, that you would experience this, that you are being equipped uh, to grow up into spiritual maturity. Um, so, we want to consider, though, in this series, um, the way in which equipping can uh, play itself out in um, what really touches our lives in many ways all the time, um, whether we realize it or not. So every once in a while, during this moment in, in our gathering uh, together, uh, we want to push pause on what is our normal uh, practice of uh, preaching through books of the Bible. That's what we normally do. Take our time going through that right now. We're in 1 Samuel. Um, we're going to finish that next year. Uh, in particular, uh, though, uh, we want to help you think about what it looks like to uh, build a strong, holistic, biblical worldview uh, on an issue that touches your life. Again, whether you maybe realize that or not. In fact, we believe and I say we as in the leaders of Mercy View, if we don't do that for you, if we don't do those things from time to time, take moments like this to talk about this, we're actually failing to live out our vision here at Mercy View. I'll go even further. The failure to do equipping and discipleship around issues like politics is one of the reasons I believe that some of us struggle, maybe many of us struggle, with how to interact with the things of this world. We should, as leaders, be preparing you to be salt and light. And this is one of the ways that we can do that. Now, second, uh, some of you may be asking, like, is this something we should even be talking about? Or, or maybe even can we talk about it? I saw something really interesting uh, it, on, on Twitter this week, or X, excuse me, uh, um, that uh, uh, I, it just blew me away. It was a picture, and it was a picture of two books sitting side by side, really thick books. Uh, here's the, here was the, there's two volumes of the same thing. Here's what it was called, Political Sermons of the American Founding Era, 1730 to 1805. And I don't have these books, but I looked this up. If you look in those two volumes of, uh, of books, you'll find 55 sermons, and I looked this up too, it's 1,779 pages uh, of, of sermons related to what this is called political sermons. Now, um, I bring that up just to say, there was a time when it was much more common for the church, the Protestant church, to talk about these kinds of things. 
Going, I mean, this, these books were called political sermons, like some would even call them that, or election sermons. And for the same reasons that they did those kinds of things, and by the way, I'll say this, this isn't the first time we've done something like this. We did this in the la last election season back in 2020. But, but we believe, again, the first point of equipping you, we, we want to help you think critically and biblically about the privilege that you have here as an American and as a Christian and trying to figure out like what, what are those things, how do those relate to one another, how do we steward what God has given us. So, a set of election sermons, political sermons, I think actually revives an old American tradition that really is just meant to encourage you to steward your citizenship and your vote for the good and flourishing of your neighbor, which we're going to talk about that here in just a moment. See, one of the misconceptions that we have is that as soon as a politician talks about something, the church can't. But just because something has been taken into the political sphere or the public square, it does not mean that it should be taken out of the pulpit or the church. All right? So, Here's how the great pastor and preacher Charles Spurgeon once said it. He said, often here it said, do not bring religion into politics. He said, this is precisely where it ought to be brought and set there in the face of all men as on a candlestick. Third, the Bible speaks prophetically on many political issues. You'll hear me say later in this series that there are straight line issues that, that we really, there's not a whole lot, we shouldn't have a whole lot of debate about what God has to say about those things. But there are also jagged line issues, issues that maybe are a little more difficult, more complex to wade through even for good Christians. But both of those ideas, straight line issues and jagged line issues, always deal with substance of some kind. Here's what I mean. Sermon series on politics typically focus on telling Christians not to divide over politics. They typically focus on telling Christians to not divide over politics and, and, and that our disagreements should be charitable. And while I truly pray that in this series we will pursue charity, we will pursue unity, we can't always, always treat the substance of some of our disagreements as merely a matter of opinion. Now that's not something we're going to get in too deeply today, but next week and week three we, we will. Some political differences, friends, are more biblical than others. Why? Because this is so key. Our unity as a people actually is dependent on a prior commitment to biblical truth. So while I care deeply, deeply, don't miss, miss your, I care deeply about our unity here. I care about how we talk about the jagged line issues, actually the straight line issues too. I care more about the substance of the disagreements uh, my duty as your pastor, um, Sean's duty as one of your pastors, is not to only help you know how to express your disagreements charitably, but if need be, correct an error about substance that you may have. Are we good? All right. Let, we just, I thought we would just jump into the deep end right at the very beginning here. You guys are already squirming, I can see. So here, here's what we're going to do in our series. We have four weeks together. The first three weeks will be a time of what I would say is primarily teaching. Um, there's some, I mean, I'm a preacher, so I want to be preaching, but uh, this is more like uh, a, a seminary classroom maybe than a, a, a pulpit kind of preaching thing. So um, I hope you'll extend grace in that because sometimes when we talk about biblical worldview stuff, we've kind of, we've got to do some of that kind of work. Um, so this week what we're looking at is this question. 
Are you ready? All right. You, if you've seen the, the uh, social media stuff, like we've put some of this out already, but the first question we're going to deal with this week is this. Is the gospel political? Is the gospel political? Next week, we're going to tackle the question, should Christians be political? And then week three, how then should we vote? And then in week four, we're actually going to have a panel with Sean and I where we want to answer your questions. We recognize that over the next few weeks, a lot of questions could pop up for you, and we want to invite you to send us your questions at elders at mercyview.com, and we will try to tackle as many of those questions as we can on week four um, of this series. So a couple other quick notes before we jump in. I am indebted to a lot of, of uh, people uh, who are informing some of what I'm going to say over these next few weeks. And I just want to give credit where, where credit is due. And this is also, for those of you that are interested, some of the thinkers and pastors and theologians that uh, um, uh, we're, we're reading and, and, and are helping us. So uh, Wayne Grudem, Jonathan Lehman, Andrew Walker, Patrick Schreiner, Peter Lightheart, um, uh, Joe Rigney, James Wood, uh, Doug Ponder, Michael Clary, Natasha Crane, and, and a good friend of mine by the name of Rick Rotaheaver. Some of, some of those, um, you'll, you'll hear some of, of what um, they have been talking about, writing about, thinking about, come through over the next few weeks, and just want to give credit where credit is due. Okay, so the second thing I just want to say is what we're going to talk about today. I want, I want you to see two things um, as we walk through our, our, our uh, topic today, and it's this. First, Jesus inaugurated a new political order through the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus inaugurated a new political order through the gospel of the kingdom. And second, kingdom citizens have been summoned to profess this new kingdom politic. Kingdom citizens have been summoned to profess this new kingdom politic. So you may already be thinking, Brad, we've jumped the shark already because you've asked the question, is the gospel political? And the answer to that question is no. Um, the gospel is the historical reality of, of the life, death, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. Right, Brad? That makes grace available to those who would receive it by placing their faith in him. The gospel is about salvation. Right? So why would you even uh, let it kind of like slip out that you would want to ask the question, is the gospel political? Why suggest that? And look, I, I get that, that question, that, that, that inclination to, to, to think about it that way, because most of us, when we hear the word politic or politics, we think of our constitutional republic system, right? Uh, a, a candidates and elections and legislation and, and voting, which we're going to be talking about some of that in this series. But when you hear me ask this question, you, you might be thinking I'm talking about part of, uh, a partisanship, right? You might be thinking I'm, I'm talking about Republicans or Democrats or the left or the right when I say that, that, that or just even asking the question if the gospel could be political. You might also think I might be, you know, advocating for the merging of the church and the state, but I'm not advocating for that either. What we must do this morning as we start our series is get our heads and our hearts wrapped around what the word politics means more broadly than just thinking about it through our constitutional republic lenses. So, what does politics mean more broadly? If you go to Webster's Dictionary, what does it have to say there? The word politics actually comes from the Greek word polis, which means city, or politikia, which means the affairs of the cities. So, when we talk about politics broadly, even when we talk about what happens in our country politically, we're talking about, you, you need to get this, the practice of organizing and regulating our lives in society, in cities, under God-ordained legal authority for the sake of justice and the flourishing of our neighbor. So, when we use the word political, 
Broadly, it simply means the activities associated with the organization and the governance of people, period. It has to do with who's in charge, who's ruling, rulership, and it, it has to do with the process of organizing our lives around common goods, common goals, and values in whatever setting we are in. So, you may not consider yourself political, but actually every single person that's sitting here in this room or standing, I guess I'm standing, because of the cultural mandate of Genesis 1, you have a God-given God -given interest in making sure that your society is organized in such a way that individuals are provided every opportunity to thrive. So if that's what politics means, we need to begin to move towards our question, the pro provocative one, is the gospel political? Well, to answer that question, we need to look back at Matthew 16. So you heard Lauren read this, but look if you would, turn with me in your Bibles and your electronic devices um, to Matthew 16, uh, beginning there uh, in verse uh, 13. Again, here's what Jesus asks his disciples. Verse 13, he says, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Um, when Jesus used that phrase, Son of Man, he was using it on purpose. He was using a term that was in reference to a prophecy about him in Daniel 7. And in Daniel 7, Jesus is described as the Son of Man who was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. So, this is not just like, hey, who do people say that I am? I'm wondering if they know I'm Jesus. All right? Jesus is asking the question, do people know that I'm the one who, who has been given dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve me? In other words, Jesus is asking his disciples if the people that he was coming in contact with in his earthly ministry knew that he was king. And at this time, the people didn't know that. But Jesus keeps asking this question to his disciples. He asks it a few times as if to like really see at least what his disciples believed about him. And then finally, the bold one, Peter, answers Jesus and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So here's what you need to know about that statement. What Peter is saying here was a confession of revolutionary proportions. He was saying that there was a new king in town. When Peter said this, what happened was he was confessing essentially that a, a new kingdom and a whole new king is, was being inaugurated. And remember our definition of politics. It's about rulership and who has the right to order our lives. What Peter make, when, when Peter makes this confession, he was confirming what Jesus said about his own kingship in Luke 4. So the story we just looked at in Matthew 16 comes after what I'm getting ready to tell you. In Luke 4... Jesus really, at the very beginning of his earthly ministry, he, he is um, in the temple and he says something that actually finds its roots in Isaiah 61, that he had come to be keen. So Peter's confession here in Matthew 16 is, remember our definition of politics, a political statement. Jesus is king. Jesus is our ruler. Jesus is our Lord. He is the one who has a right now to order our lives. I'll go even further. There is nothing as politically powerful as the message that inaugurates the kingdom of God. So yes, in that sense, the gospel is political. It is the message that Jesus is king. So... Let's bring this, a few things together, some ideas. A political gospel simply means 
that God is sovereign over the whole world, not just the inner reaches of the human heart. It's no less than that. The gospel is no less than God's redeeming work for individuals. Don't mishear me. But it is also, as pastor and author Peter Lightheart says, a redeeming project that includes the ordering of society and the establishment of a coming city. Now, we've been using the word king and kingdom on purpose. When Jesus spoke of the gospel in his earthly ministry, he usually said it was of the kingdom or concerning the kingdom. So you can't understand the gospel without understanding the kingdom. The two are intimately related. If Jesus' message is good news, the content of that good news includes the kingdom of God. Jesus said it this way, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. I think sometimes we read that verse and we, we go, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. That sounds great. And then we go to repent and believe the good news. That's, that's like a different idea. No, it's all connected. The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom Jesus announced is a new society, a new social order, a new political order. Again, remember our definition of politics. We could almost say it this way, monarchy is God's sacred mission of bringing heaven, which is the blueprint for all that happens here on earth first, the garden, the tabernacle, the ark, the temple, bringing that heaven on earth. Right? When we pray the Lord's Prayer together and we pray on earth as it is in heaven, that's what we are praying, friends. And this brings me to the first thing I want to invite you to see this morning. Jesus inaugurated a new political order through the gospel of the kingdom. Have you ever received a Christmas card with um, Isaiah 9-6 on the back? You know what Isaiah 9-6 says? Um, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. As a side note, we're actually going to look at the four, those four characteristics of, of uh, Jesus in our Advent series that we do annually in December, so, so stay tuned for that. But I, Isaiah 9 isn't like this warm, fuzzy, you know, thing on the back of a, of a Christmas card. Um, it's actually a prophecy that was making, listen, political claims. When Jesus pronounced the coming of the kingdom of God, he introduced a problem. Other kingdoms already existed. And they existed then and they exist now. So if he has a kingdom that he is inaugurating, the competing kingdoms have a problem. Those kingdoms are unavoidably going to bump into one another, no? Right? So, why did Herod seek to kill Jesus when he was born? Why did Jesus later in his life, when he was older, call Herod a fox? It was because... Both the spiritual and political witness of Jesus included more than just submitting to governing authorities. It also included subversive language against the corrupt and unethical ruling elite. So we cannot privatize and depoliticize Jesus' message and simply say that he was establishing only, only the rule of God in people's hearts by winning souls. We just can't do that. It's not treating the Bible with integrity. When Jesus died, above him was a sign that said, the king of the Jews. That's why Herod sought to kill him when he was born and why he ultimately did die on a cross later. He was not only a threat to the spiritual lives of the people who resisted him, but also the political ones. So, Jesus himself 
because of, we start to put all this together, some more to, together, Jesus himself was asserting and enacting the way of a new kingdom upon his arrival. He proclaimed, he presented and performed a new public life, a, a new public reality, a new social reality, and yes, a new political reality. When Pilate asked the Jews if he could crucify their king, they replied, we have no king but Caesar. It's no wonder that Jesus was crucified on a Roman cross and mocked as a king. Here's how C.S. Lewis once said it, enemy occupied territory. That is what this world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed. You might say landed in disguise and is calling us all to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. Jesus was not merely a teacher, a moralist, a sacrificial lamb, a counselor, a psychologist, or a spiritual guru. Jesus, I think C.S. Lewis is using our definition of politics here, Jesus was the bearer of a new political regime. So again, yes, this kind, this kind of gospel is political. Just a while ago, when we sang the third verse of the doxology, did you know that you were sing, singing a new kingdom politic? What did you sing? Praise God, his throne transcends, his crown and his kingdom have no end from now through all eternity. Praise God, the Holy Trinity. That is a gospel, kingdom gospel, politic. So in its purest sense, in, in the way we're defining it, the kingdom of God and his gospel is an all-encompassing vision of the world and human life. And how it is to be enacted in the church, showcased to our neighbors, and spread to the world. Jesus inaugurated a new political order through the gospel of the kingdom. So, what does that mean for us? Well, I want to do a couple of things here. I want to first give you kind of a high-level charge, if you're not already uncomfortable, if I haven't already lost you, a high-level charge, and then to apply that charge in a specific way. So, first, the high-level charge. If the gospel is a public politic that gives the world and its rulers a vision of the coming city in the here and now, friends, it absolutely intersects with how you and I engage with what we typically think about horizontal politics, our constitutional republic, elections, candidates, legislation, and voting. It absolutely intersects with it. It can't not forgive the double negative. Let me say it simply. A public and political gospel of the kingdom that proclaims Jesus is Lord and King requires a public faith that speaks to culture in such a way that is bold and uncompromising. See, some churches, some Christians, in reaction to the partisanship that they see, and friends, there is partisanship for sure, but in reaction to that, they have chosen to privatize their faith. Very little is said publicly about how the gospel should shape their public stances, if at all. And without knowing it, some have begun to, and in some cases completely constructed, a distinction between personal and political ethics. And this really... Um, I think maybe the way I can help you think about it is this way. We are really good at talking about and writing about and, and, and reflecting on things like repentance and faith and things like spiritual practices. And I'm thankful for that. We should be talking about those things and writing about those things and preaching about those things and, and reflecting on those things. But I've noticed, and this is true, this is convicting for me to say about myself, there are very few attempts to address how the gospel in Christianity itself is a public politic. If Jesus is Lord of you, if Jesus is Lord of me, 
We should desire to bring every part of our lives in conformity with Christ. The division that we've made between all kinds of things, including religion and politics, was never a given in Jesus' time. It really hasn't been a given throughout most of church history. And so I, I think we have a lot more work to do as a people in the area of what I would call political discipleship. That leads me to the second thing I want to invite you to see this morning. Kingdom citizens have been summoned to profess a new kingdom politic. Kingdom citizens have been summoned to profess a new kingdom politic. See, the gospel message is a world-forming, public reality. Jesus calls people through the gospel of the kingdom to a new way of life, a new society, a new kind of community, to become delegates to the world from a different kingdom. A, to be a foretaste of what life will be like when Christ returns. So here's what that means. Your Christianity should never be private. In many ways, what we're talking about has everything to do with our mission as a people and as a church. A, a people who are understanding how to apply the kingship of God in a place like our horizontal politics, it's, it's a way for us to integrate our confession that Jesus is Lord. Because as we do that, we are actually, it's a, it's a way that we love our neighbor. We're going to talk about that more in this series, but this confession that Jesus is Lord is meant to always be lived out loud. You and I, if Jesus is your king, you're one of his subjects. You're a kingdom citizen. Kingdom citizens have been summoned to profess a new kingdom politics. So, that's the high-level charge. Live out your kingdom summons. Now, I want to apply that charge in a very specific way this morning. And one of the questions that you may be asking right now is, to whom should that kingdom politic be announced to, Brad? In the past, I would typically keep it super general here and say it should be professed to, to the culture, uh, to the world, uh, and that wouldn't be wrong. Uh, it's just broad, right? And I really want to serve you this morning. Uh, again, I want you to hear my, my heart as a pastor and a shepherd. I, I want to serve you because I care about you. I care about your souls. So we need to get more specific. And I want to apply this to an area that will probably be, if you're not already uncomfortable, one of those uncomfortable moments that we're going to probably have over the next few weeks. Um, Paul um, once said to his friends in the Corinthian church, he's like, guys, it's time for you to stop drinking milk and eat meat. Okay? And uh, he actually said, you're not ready for the meat is what he said. So he was really confronting them about their spiritual immaturity. But what he was saying in that confrontation was, you should be ready for more challenging truths. You should be ready to, to, to receive what might be difficult to, to receive, but so that you can selflessly walk in Christ, live according to His Spirit, and mature, in, in, uh, mature spiritually. And so, I believe that's true for us as well. So who in culture are we supposed to declare the kingdom gospel politic to? I'm curious, like for you right now, what comes to mind? What, what person or persons or people in culture are we supposed to declare this to? There are a, a few different people we could probably point to, but I want to just talk about one this morning, and it's this. The government itself. In political gospel public witness in a politically crazy world, professor and author Patrick Schreiner says that all human governments, regardless of their form, 
are subordinate to God's rule. It is God, he says, who is in charge, and humans must align themselves with his purposes. His authority over our lives is of a different order than the authority of governing officials. So as we think about what it looks like to profess this to the government itself, Schreiner says there's really two sides of the same coin that really it all boils down to. We really have two choices on how to profess this. He says, first is submit. What does it mean to submit to someone? It means to defer, right? To yield to someone, to ultimately to obey them, right? That's one side of the gospel coin. Schreiner says the other side of the gospel coin, this is a strong word, is subvert. What does that mean? Well, I think it means anything from challenging to to opposing to disobeying. And here's what might you might be like, Brad, are you like, why are we talking about this this morning? Okay. Those those things, submitting and subverting, aren't contradictory things. They're actually, they both stem from the same conviction that Jesus is Lord. In our ser- sermon series in Romans, you may remember we looked at those two ideas, particularly in Romans 13. Schreiner says that both of these postures are the ways that we profess a kingdom gospel politic because they show who is our Lord. Let me say it another way. God sets up governments to submit to if they aren't encroaching on the sphere of the Lord's church. But we subvert when they do. Now, I think Christians, and I think most of us here, I mean, I think this is true particularly at Mercy View, we don't naturally have a problem with submission to the government. On the one hand, I really appreciate that. Um, It means this, I think, I hope, that you are reading and listening to and seeking to apply Matthew 22, Romans 13, Titus 3, and 1 Peter 2. But I'm curious about something. I wonder in our attempt to read and listen and apply those passages, we have created this sort of default response that our our approach and posture to government is always submission. Actually, my growing conviction is that the answer to the question of should that be our default response is no. I'm afraid submission is often misapplied and in some cases overapplied. Now, don't mishear me. I'm not saying the opposite of this either. I'm not saying that the, somehow our default should always and only be subversion, challenging and opposing and disobeying the government. What, I, what I'm saying is that our default, and I think increasingly so in the days ahead, should be to always and only ask both of those questions. Submit or subvert? Should I obey or should I defy? Because as we look to live out our gospel politic as a gospel people, we will have to wrestle with this. And part of the challenge is that the issues are complex. I get that. But I think for the sake of of what we would call unity, And to minimize disagreement, what we do is say, I would rather just submit than not have the thornier conversation about why we maybe shouldn't. Because that's harder. It's more emotional. A lot more heat around that. So, because we don't typically, like, lean that way, I, I think we are woefully unprepared for what it looks like to appropriately and with biblical integrity challenge and oppose or even disobey in the days ahead. 
Now, some of you are really squirming right now. I feel it. And I don't want to, I'm not going to read all of this again, and, and, and I don't bring Acts 16 up as a proof text, but I bring it up as an example. It's not the only example of this in the book of Acts. You see this also in, in Acts 22, 24, and 26. But for the sake of time, just let me remind you of what you heard Lauren read. In, Paul is in Philippi. He is basically demon possession. He like does an exorcism, right? I um, mean, expels a spirit of divination from a slave girl and the people who were basically trafficking her get upset because they can't, uh, you know, continue their, their livelihood. They're deprived of that. And so the girl's owners drag Paul and Silas to the magistrates, the leaders, the city leaders, charging them with attacking the customs of the Roman colony of Philippi. The customs of the Roman Philippi, uh, colony of Philippi. So a mob and the magistrates, the leaders, strip them, beat them to a pulp, and the city leaders throw them into prison. Now, what we didn't read was the amazing story of the jailer coming to faith, right? That was what's sandwiched in between this. But we, we jumped forward to just continue this part of the, the story. Um, then um, the, it says that the magistrates like realized that they needed to let them out of prison for some reason. They were in error, and they do that. And, and the leaders wanted to just sort of let them leave quietly. But did you notice what Paul did? This is what I want you to notice. Paul said, no. He said, you have let Roman citizens be beaten and imprisoned without trial. And Paul wants a legal, but don't miss this, a political skirmish when he achieved this. He, he left behind a new Philippi, which now, in our story in Acts 16, is permitting a religious group to teach a subversive way that now, because of its mere existence of a Christian community there, forces the city, it forced them to alter their public norms. Here's how Lightheart says it. To many readers of the book of Acts, the early church looks like a counter-community blissfully unconcerned about public life. I mean, that's convicting to me. That's how I've read it. He says that's a misreading. In the book of Acts, Luke records individual and mass conversions, but he views the church's mission through a theopolitical lens. To be sure, the church is a distinct communion with its own ethos and practices. But again, remember our definition of politics. It is a political force that should shake the foundations of civic life. See, the church and Christians in Acts 16 challenged and transform public life precisely because it confronted the world as people loyal to another king. In other words, they didn't submit by default. They asked, should we submit, should we subvert? In this instance, Paul said, subvert. That's the answer. They spoke truth to power. Why? They had a higher authority. They had a greater mission. Jesus is king and the flourishing of his church in Philippi. So why am I applying the charge to profess our kingdom politic in this way this morning? Please hear me. Again, I love you. <laughs> I'm saying this because of that. Like, my heart is to pastor you and to shepherd you as someone who loves you and cares for your soul. I believe that in the days ahead, and I, I think we've seen cues of this in our very recent past, we will have to do the hard work, and it will be hard work. It'll be uncomfortable for you, probably. It'll be uncomfortable for me. But we will have to do the hard work of asking this question more often than we realize. Should we submit? Should we defer? Should we obey? Or should we subvert? Should we challenge? Should we oppose? Should we disobey? As a church to the government, 
as we live out our gospel kingdom politics as kingdom citizens. Notice that I'm not only promoting the idea of subversion. I'm, I'm saying we should ask those questions together. Why? Because I, as I look out at what's happening in our culture, I, I think increasingly culture finds itself downstream of politics. There's a lot of debate about whether what's downstream of what. This is my contention this morning. If you want to grab coffee and disagree with me, we, we can have that conversation. But increasingly so, culture finds itself downstream of, of politics. Politics is here, culture's here, downstream. Or maybe we could even say policies, right? Who makes policy? <laughs> Government. It's not the other way around, in my opinion. Uh, he, here's what I mean. We minimize the role that politics and policy play in society. Frankly, I think some of us just ignore it. And we ignore the way that it impacts society, which when things impact society, it impacts you, it impacts your family. Politics is no longer downstream of culture. Politics, in many ways, and the policies that result from it are at the headwaters of many streams that are increasingly becoming our culture. So, the reason I want to talk about this today is this will require something from us moving forward that we have to prepare for now. So, where does this leave us today? Well, regardless of what the answer to the question is, subvert or submit, we need to remember where this alternative politic is manifested. It is manifested in the community of believers that we call the local church. Right? We talked about the, this forming a new people, a new community, a new social order. That is the church. That's what we're talking about. So this is, so Im- this is why it's so important for you in the days ahead to be a part of a local church, to be connected meaningfully to other Christians that can remind you of your true loyalty and the kingdom to come. The irony in talking about politics in this series is that you might think we're wanting to make you more political. And that's not the the goal. We're actually wanting to make you more biblical so that you can be more uh, more faithfully political. (laughs) Whenever a preacher preaches, he's making a political speech, so to speak. He's reminding you that Jesus is king in the present. Whenever you receive communion here in a moment, you are re-pledging your allegiance to Christ's kingdom. And whenever you share the gospel of Christ with a neighbor, with a friend, or a family member, you are helping advance Christ's campaign of kingship among the nations. That happens, all of that, in the context of a local church. And so that's where I would want to end this morning, the, the political life must begin inside the church. Our primary subversive political witness is to create a community that is loyal to King Jesus and that makes all other political allegiances pale in comparison. This is what we will, uh, this is what will have a leavening effect on our society. This is how the gospel, the church, and horizontal politics intersect. Here's how philosopher D.C. Schindler says that if God God is excluded from the political, the city will be soulless. In fact, because it cannot help but have a soul as a city, it will have something like a functionalized, uh, bureaucraticized, uh, technologicalized, mechanicized, and coercively imposed substitute. For a soul. That was kind of a clunky. Sorry for that. I didn't read that very well. Basically, he's saying, in the, you know, in the place of where, what should be in the soul of the city, it will be replaced by something, a substitute of some kind. So, friends, you and I, we have a greater message that can give our city the kind of soul it desperately needs. A message that says, receiving mercy, vertical reconciliation, happens while God also forms a a people. We become a people, horizontal reconciliation. 
God has mercy on us by forgiving us our sins, and a necessary consequence of that is inclusion in his people. To put it another way, Christianity offers its own identity politics. It says that our union with Christ becomes the most fundamental thing about you. So the question is, is, is that the most fundamental thing about you? It should be an all-defining reality for your identity, that you have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer you who lives, but Christ who lives in you. So it is with everyone who is born again of the Spirit and declared a citizen of heaven. And here's the thing, your Christian tribe is going to make demands on your life individually and on our life together as a tribe, and some of those things you won't like. They'll be challenging, but they're right and good because we want to profess our submission to King Jesus. But those demands that are made on us will also mean that outsiders are likely not going to like them either. But make no mistake, as we move forward in the power of Christ, our message and our existence as a people is nothing if not saying to the world, Jesus is king. Why? Because he is. Let's pray together.